Dartmouth used to be a center of computing excitement. When I was here in 1984, 1983, I made a choice to buy a PC. And you could get a PC if you were here at, at Dartmouth because John Kemeny had been president and he'd written BASIC. And now I see 50 years ago he wrote BASIC, oh my god. And uh, Dartmouth had connections. We could get a PC. I bought a PC. I had a choice, buy a new car or buy a PC. Think about that. And uh, serial number less than 10,000. So I go down to Citibank to have an interview. And I walk in the bank. And every bank officer has a PC on their desk. And I just bought one of these things. And it gets spookier. They had robots running around the office delivering mail. It gets even crazier. Every one of these PCs was connected around the world with a cute thing called City Mail. And you could send Lotus spreadsheets and WordStar documents because Walter Riston had bought a satellite. You can read about this guy. He wrote a book uh, called The Collapse of Sovereignty, which you know, predicts and describes how communication really makes the world flat. We don't approach data the way that Scotty does. Scotty grabs a, a, a sample of it and pulls out 10,000 records and takes it apart and finds the strong variables that'll bench press 50 pounds. And what I do, what we do, is we take the whole data set. And our approach is really, really good at working out the, finding the shards of gold and the tails of the distribution. I, I can understand like how you get the financial data. Right. But then you, don't you also need to know like what, do they have insurance now or not? Or, or I have to have performance data. If so, if I'm going to build a, an underwriting model for MetLife, pick a name that's a customer or was a customer, I have to have their performance file of people who have been customers and who have had claims and haven't had claims. Oh. Okay? And then what I do is I append credit data to it. And in fact, that's one of the messages you know, that I want to give during this talk is that uh, a lot of folks show up and they say, I have big data. And the reason they have big data is because storage is so cheap. You know, storage used to be $1,000 a gig and now it's three cents. So everybody has big data. You know? your, your laptop now has a terabyte on it. But that data alone is not enough to make a good, uh, to, to, uh, <coughs> to create value. You have to have, or in my experience, there's real value. You have to bring in other data sources to be able to build the, back, to build the backdrop. So credit data turns out to be a wonderful backdrop because it's clean. It's very accurate. The rules are very, very well understood about how to use it. The FCRA is crystal clear about how you can use it. And you append your performance data to it. Now you build your model on that universe. A lot of companies think that they have the answer inside their walled garden of data. Facebook, they thought they had it. I went and spoke with them. They said, no, no, we know how to do this. We can get qualified leads. And, uh, we know how to qualify leads, and uh, that was just after they went public. So I went, okay, we'll see. You know, I've been in this a while. I said, we'll see you. Uh, today they're doing it my way. And the problem they had was uh, they lost a couple of customers. General Motors uh, dropped them right after they went public. Why? Because they had too many people like Richard going drooling over the Corvette site, but he's not going to buy a car. Need a chiste, okay? They wanted me, you know, but they couldn't get me. So to get me now, I do qualified leads outside on, I'll call it terrestrial data, like credit data, and then toss those leads to Facebook. And Facebook knows how to tickle their fish inside their garden. And now the response rates are fabulous. But you know, a message to people is your data in a vacuum isn't good enough. You've got to think about external data sets and gluing them together. Fuzzy matching is a big thing. The big data set that is huge, that's a total mess right now, is health data. And that's where the big future is. Um, we've been fiddling around with it for six years. And uh, a couple of comments I'll make about it. It's uh, incredibly disorganized. It's filthy. And the filth factor is what's going to keep us from extracting value from it for a while. There is a huge opportunity in this space because the amount of medical data has just exploded in the last 
many years because we've spent a lot of money on doing research, medical research and basic science to do a much better job. Um, I have a disease that when I was diagnosed 13 years ago, I mean, the knowledge, it was about this much in paper, and today it's like this, you know? It's beyond a human capability to keep it all in your head. So what happens now, uh, people, about 40% of the medical encounters are referrals and tests. One would say defensive medicine, okay? They took away the tort reform problem, the tort problem, meaning suits, a few years ago. You're capped at 500,000. The referral rate didn't go down. And the reason it didn't go down is because people don't want to make a mistake. The, it's like, oh, maybe Joe knows something that I haven't seen. You know, it's human nature. I want to make sure that I'm doing the right thing. I know there's so much knowledge, I can't keep track of it. So a diagnostic aid, diagnostic aids are really where it's at to make it more efficient so that when you do a referral, you have more confidence or, I mean, sorry, when you do a diagnosis, you have more confidence. And uh, we built the original movie recommendation systems for Netflix and Blockbuster. So we have an idea how to do this. But the data, the damn data in the medical space, and it's also very, you know, I mentioned FCRA, it's well understood how to handle credit data. It's the Wild West in medical data. There's three things you sort of need to think about with data, big data especially. Where are you going to store this stuff? Storage is important, but now you've got it stored. How are you going to munch it? You know, Is it going to be a tool like mine, or is it going to be regression or neural networks? What's appropriate? What works? And finally, how are you going to move it around? Baud rate is everything. The consumption of PCs is going down like a stone, and these things are what's going to drive the world very fast. And, uh, you know, to, to one of the issues that I mentioned earlier is baud rate, being able to, you know, can, we all pay a toll every month that we have one of these things to AT&T. You know, are you, <laughs> you know, it's a fee. And not enough of the, you know, the planet, not everybody on the planet can afford the toll. Uh, right now, I think the numbers are there's seven billion people on Earth and something like five billion of them have cell phones and one billion of them have smartphones. So. I was talking about futurists earlier. Right now, my hat's off to the folks at Google and uh, Facebook. They are investing big money to provide free internet service to the world. You'll be able to get free bro broadband and get on in a couple of years. And uh, they're doing it in very innovative ways. Um, you know, proud papa, my, dad, my kid is involved in one of the projects, building solar-powered drones down in New Mexico to do it. So. Uh, uh, but these things are amazing. Uh, just watching how uh, bank branch use has collapsed or is collapsing in the last year. Finally, the promise of electronic banking is, being, is hitting the banks. And branches saw a decline in usage and ATMs um, because of these things. You could de now deposit just taking a picture of your check. You don't need to go to the bank anymore. And that's what started pushing it down. Um, another data set that I look at and kind of, w I won't say worry, but uh, get ner not nervous about, but think that uh, the credit card banks should get nervous about is the iTunes database. 800 million people. They've got your card information. They've got your transaction knowledge. They could make electronic purchasing an easy and delightful experience. And they have the security with the, the thumb biometric reader, so it would be safe and easy. But reading about this mesh communication where it goes from cell phone to cell phone and doesn't even go through the internet. Yeah. Is, is, that, is there a future in that? Um, maybe. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's bandwidth intensive and it sucks away some of the value of your phone. But there's lots of ways to move data around and that'll be one of them. What I'm seeing is a much more intelligent network than what we've got today. And that'll be part of it. Um, you know, I think that we've got uh, a lot of, there, there's just too much cool technology coming down so that all, all with the goal of moving data and making the use of technology a more pleasant experience. And that's, I think, one of the goals that a lot of people miss when they talk about big data. Big data provides these answers and this information, but it needs to be presented in an easy to digest and 
usable fashion so that my wife, who can barely download an app, gets value out of it. And so software design and interface will be, as in, will be very important, continue to be very important. But I, you know, my prediction is it's, it's going to be on these things. I mean, I go to the hospital once a week, and every time they make me, fill out, they make me kill a tree. You know, I've been going for 13 years. Get it right, guys. You don't need to know that it's me again. Okay, <laughs> and kill another tree. No, there's, there's human error in the medical world is ghastly, and it's a, it, that's why I said it'll be years before we get that right. Yeah, not just human error, but activity, right? So even if you get it right, you're still going to 14 clicks. Yeah. Before you oh no, it. it's 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 impossible. You have no idea how gross those systems are and how much work that needs to be done. I mean, it's things like when you buy something on online, you know, and they bring down the menu for what the state abbreviations are. Yes. They don't have that on Epic. For instance, I mean, you know, I mean, M MI could be how many different states? Michigan, Missouri, yeah, you know, they guys are nuts. So, you know, I was data, you know, in, in the finance, I was going to have one last war story about financial because I was supposed to talk about financial according to him. Um, when the financial crisis started in 08, um, the canary in the coal mine was Nevada. Nevada had, the recession hit there first, and we, I reached out to the Nevada file and uh, remembering my credit training about early modifications pay, I uh, did the math. And early modifications means this. If you're a borrower uh, or if you're, you're a good credit officer, you keep track of your credits. It doesn't matter whether they're individual credits or commercial credits. And if you spot a borrower that's weakening, but they haven't missed a payment, and you get in there and modify them, you'll only write off 20% of those loans. They'll only redefault at a, at a rate of 20%. If, however, you wait until somebody goes down two or three payments, and then you modify them, those loans redefault at 80%. So there's a lot of damage that happens. Mo early mods pay. You save a lot of bank capital. And in the case of foreclosures, you st save a lot of people from being thrown out of their homes. So I took that data. And in December of 08, when the crisis was crazy, was meeting with senior folks, uh, board level folks at the Fed. And uh, they took that data and they incorporated that into the HAMP program. And the HAMP program put $70 billion against early modifications, or against modifications and early mods as well. Unfortunately, corn was corollary did not work out. We didn't sell it to Treasury properly. And Treasury, had a whole different approach. They came up with the argument of moral hazard. They said, oh no, you can't possibly give people a deal. They'll screw us. You know, they'll screw the taxpayer. So they foreclosed uh, four million families in this country that did not need to be foreclosed. Human tragedy. And, uh, but, you know, the data keeps talking. And it's now December of 11, and I come back with the data again and uh, debunked the moral hazard argument. 20% of the homes were underwater in this country, but only 2% were defaulting. Main Street pays its bills. Main Street pays its bills. And we were able to demonstrate that to them. And uh, the GSEs, Fannie and Freddie, had already sucked down the risk. And what, they, what, we were, what we were able to convince them to do was loosen the underwriting rules so people could refi from the high interest rates that they were at, 5 and 6%, down to the market rates, which at the time were 3%. And we've had a refi boom for the last two years. And about a week before the president spoke and announced this in his State of the Union, I got a call, which was, Stuart, you influence policy again. So the data did some talking, and this time we got it sold. Where do you see the data analytics industry going as it tries? Is the, uh, are the tools and the talent going to disperse and inner industries outside of finance and healthcare where it's going to be more commoditized or is it going to remain? No, I think that it's not necessarily even that high price. And everybody talks about a shortage of folks to do analytics. <laughs> I don't think there's a shortage of, of folks to do analytics. There's a shortage of folks to manage data cleanse the data, get it ordered, get it into usable uh, uh, lumps. But, you know, how many, uh, and, and really the only way to do this is with machine learning. So how many analytical people do you think Facebook has? Twelve. Okay. You don't need an army. You need talent. 
and uh, you know there's other companies that they think they need armies and uh, you know what they're doing is they'll um, buy a big license for SAS regression modeling and they put together an army of people offshore to build regression models which are time consuming to build if you're going to build a good one and uh, that's how they do it and that's kind of yesterday's way of doing it because the turnaround time on a on a regression model six to ten weeks why build a model in a few hours machine learning so I don't think that it's really a capacity issue for the actual analytics it's a capacity issue for getting the data clean it's going to take years to get the medical data right, for instance. And it's really bookkeeping and just really detailed, you know, getting the shard of glass out of each and every record.